And by this point, we had like, we had like 300 people in engineering. And this was by far the largest group put together anywhere in the world to build an electric two-wheeler. So I remember uh, meeting this really, really, really smart supplier uh, who I actually respect a lot. Uh, and he gave me candid feedback. I have no idea how you're doing this, but if I didn't know you, I would just tell you, this is stupid. This is crazy. And all of us in the supply community think you are off. You're, you're, you're completely off. Welcome to Millionaire Mondays, the show where we bring you the stories of real Indian startups told by the entrepreneurs that built them. I'm Caleb Friesen, and on the show today, I sat down with Tarun Mehta, the co-founder and CEO of Aether Energy. And this podcast was a bit of a departure from our usual origin story format because, quite frankly, Tarun has told this story way too many times. Now, in case you're not familiar with this story, let me quickly catch you up. So Tarun and his co-founder, Swapnil Jain, came up with the idea for Aether Energy all the way back in 2009. They were attending college at IIT Madras, and later on in 2013, they registered Aether Energy as a company with the goal of building the first ever made in India indigenous electric scooter. After a few pre seed rounds and a couple of loans, Darun and Swapnil raised a million dollars from Sachin and Bini Bunsel, and with that money, they were able to create a low speed electric scooter, the S340. They worked on this scooter for five years before realizing that Indians actually wanted something more powerful and they were also ready to pay for it. So instead, they launched the Aether 450, which was the most powerful scooter in India at the time. And today, that is their flagship product. The 450X and 450S have put Aether in the number four position in India's rapidly growing electric two-wheeler industry. And as of the day that Don and I sat down to record this podcast, they're officially international too. They're selling electric scooters in Nepal. And Don and I talked about this during the podcast, along with a bunch of other interesting stuff like India's role in the global electric two-wheeler industry, where China has a surprisingly loose grip on its supremacy, the realities of building a hardware business in India, startup opportunities in India's current energy industry, and a little-known near-death experience that could have put Aether out of business. So with that out of the way, I really hope that you enjoy this slightly different approach to Millionaire Mondays. We went completely off script with this podcast. I had a bunch of questions about the story of Aether Energy that I didn't really get a chance to ask Tarun because we just improvised the whole thing. But if you enjoy this free-flowing, organic conversation, then leave a comment down below and let me know so that I understand what people are actually looking for in this business podcast. And now let's jump into the conversation and I will catch you on the other side. So when, when we originally thought of the vehicle, um, we had no idea about cost. So we thought this thing is going to be sold at 80,000 rupees when mm -hmm. an Activa used to be 65. And um, it's not like we had built an Activa, uh, Honda Activa. So we came up with a spec on paper that seemed fun. And we wrote it as a prototype and it was fun. But as we started putting real muscle on it, uh, started getting the weeds of the design, we realized a lot of tiny annoyances. Like, hey, listen, this thing can't take two people on a really steep slope. And I was like, hey, after you ask somebody to pay like a 15% premium on a petrol scooter, you can't apologize for the fact that, yeah, but you know... If you try to go up a ramp, you're going to yeah, fall down. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. It's, it's, <laughs> like it's like a very really sad story. It's like neither here nor there. Yeah. So we started upping the performance and um, we quickly realized that, yeah, that spec is not good enough. We need to go higher. We need to go higher. We need to go higher. So we ended up with what Was like, it like 13 or 15 degree grade was kind of the, the target? Uh, actually, I think we hit 18 degrees. With the uh, 450, right? Yeah. So this yeah. became the best gradient uh climbability in the country mm. in scooters. Yeah. Um, and we kind of, we, we basically had an internal principle that we'll only build shit that we like. Mm. We're not going to do this thing of let's build for the customer because, and I put up posters in the office celebrating this, build for us. Mm. Like it's a pretty big philosophy. Okay. And I'm pretty vocal about it. I'm yeah. like, I'm not saying screw the customer. I'm just saying life is too short. Don't build stuff that you don't like yourselves, right? Um, and you go out and talk to the consumer to us understand what is it that they want to, they, like, how can you market this better? But don't waste time building stuff that you don't like. It's just not worth it. So unfortunately- but what, Wouldn't the advice from like investors or people in the industry be like, well, no, like do your market research, find out exactly what 
the largest percentage of Indian consumers that you're at least the ones that you're targeting want and then build for that. I think that's that would be conventional wisdom, right? So let me describe it differently uh, uh, because the end result is not very different. But my point is there's a lot of stuff you can build. But you've got to figure out the right intersection of stuff that can, people want and stuff that you want to build. How, I, how important is that? I think it's very important. Yeah. I think if, if you start building stuff that people want, but you don't want to build, you're stuck in a dead-end job. You're stuck in a dead-end, not dead-end. You're stuck in a, even if you make a lot of money on it, I don't think you will find satisfaction. You'll be like, oh, okay, it's seven years. I think it's time for me to move on and do something else. I think we want to, if you want to spend like 30, 40, 50 years doing something, it's got to be absolutely fun every day. Um, so my my philosophy is, you first figure out what is it that you like to build, what is it that you want to work on. Obviously, don't be stupid. Don't build, just don't go and build it. Go out and figure who is the customer for it, right? Like, and is, are there enough customers for it? If they're not, don't build that. Find out something else that you want to build. But basically, at no point, sign up to build something that people want, but you don't like. So the intersection has to exist. Uh, and in our case, the intersection happened at a pretty performance scooter. So, because the early on, a lot of the team members were from race teams in colleges. So, so I let them be. I'm like, listen, if that's what you guys like, and I love it too, we should totally build this. We'll figure out uh, how people like it along the way. And we did that. We did a lot of those sessions. We we kept meeting people for like two years as we were building this. So I was internally, personally, I was pretty confident that people would like the 450 and not the 340 in comparison. But it was so hard to say no to every piece of research that we formally did. Right. So, so we did a lot of formal research, by the way. It's not like I didn't. Um, we got agencies involved. We got them in for pricing, for spec and everything. And ultimately, we shipped something that was 180, like fully opposite of what all research said. Hmm. So was the S340, was that more sort of a research-oriented vehicle? Like you built it for other people rather than for yourself and your team? So 340 is, is what we could build at like maybe a lakh. Uh, but we weren't, we weren't going to make money on it. And we weren't having fun on that vehicle. 450 is the spec we started having fun on. But it goes above the, the sort but of But it went price. above the lakh uh, price barrier, right? Uh, uh, by the way, we're losing money on both, hands over fist. So it's... From a business perspective, it was completely okay, chill to build either because anyone was going to lose a lot of money. Uh, but 450 seemed like the most sensible choice. Eventually, you could make it work. Uh, 340, also, you could make it work. It's just that at a lower spec. Uh, but people voted. Like and, and and today, I think most of the vehicles in the field, not not just us, sorry, even all our competition. So everybody who who copied Aether after, everybody, uh, nobody built the 340 spec. Everybody built, built the 450 or a higher spec. Uh, which is fantastic validation. It's it's not like you know we missed an opportunity in building 340. Turns out that spec was never the right spec sure. for this market. You guys were trailblazers and kind of did the reality of Aether. The way that I look at it is that you guys did a lot of the heavy lifting for the rest of the industry, right? Mm. Everyone else was able to look at you guys and say, oh, like they had to cancel the pre-orders of their 340 customers and like probably piss a couple of people off. Right, you guys had to to make that not not necessarily a mistake, but you kind of you had to take that step that other people didn't have to take. Right, all of these huh, people sure. that have come after you guys have just been. Actually, and, uh, sadly, a lot of companies made the same mistake of, oh, of really? announcing. Like even Ola did that. I think they announced a two kilowatt hour version at one point, never shipped it, so they also had to cancel. Uh, I think TVS announced a right, higher yeah. spec. Yeah, the S1 and the S1 Pro, right? Yeah, I think they had like a two kilowatt hour version, which they never shipped. I think they had a 75,000 S1 Air that they never shipped. So I think eventually this mistake every company makes. But yeah, you're right. There's a lot of stuff that we had to figure out ourselves uh, because there was nobody else. Well, it's really interesting though, because when you look at China, right, that, that market is like, I don't know if the word dominated is correct, but like a lot of the electric scooters in that market are slow speed, like low power. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of people think of China as like uh, a perfect sort of, you can compare China and India and the markets are pretty similar in terms of what consumers want. Um, whereas India, and the other the other piece of wisdom too is that conventional wisdom is that Indian people want value for money, right? They'd rather pay less for something, even if it's not as high quality and maybe not as performative, but kind of what you guys realized is that, no, people want the 450 even though it's more expensive and even though it's more of like a premium 
vehicle. I think that's really that's really interesting and, and probably surprising as well for a lot of people. Actually, that was a starting insight when we switched to building vehicles and not just batteries. So the first insight that we had, uh, the first opportunity that I saw when we started thinking about ether energy was this idea of uh, building battery packs. And that was exactly looking at China. We kind of looked at China. We saw that, oh, you know, all these low speed electric scooters, they seem to work fantastically well. India is generally like a decade behind China in most technologies. So if these things are going fine for the last few years, it's only a matter of time before they will hit India. So, and everybody's building lead acid batteries. We should build lithium and batteries with the same vehicle, problem solved. But the real insight came when I started meeting customers and realized, you know what? Everything that I'm reading about the Chinese customer is absolutely untrue when you talk to somebody in India. Like there's nothing that holds water. China force created supply and demand for EV two wheelers. They, they, I, I think it, before Ether started, I remember there were like 400 companies building electric motors for scooters, electric scooters in China, heavily commoditized. They brought the prices down and that worked brilliantly well because at, it coincided with a time in China's, um, uh, China's economy where there were a lot of farm workers who, who whose earnings were going up. Suddenly, like all these folks were like earning maybe like four or five thousand uh, dollars per capita. So suddenly, if you gave them an option of buying like a three hundred dollar electric scooter, four hundred dollar electric scooter, it made a lot of sense, right? For like the for like the absolute bottom of the pyramid. India, the minute you bring a four hundred dollar electric scooter, actually the farm workers still can't buy it. Like we don't have four hundred dollars. At, at that level. So people who can buy two wheelers, um, they are, they, they, their earning power is substantially higher. And contrary to what you just said, value for money, which basically is an expectation that people want lower cost, absolutely untrue in two wheelers, somehow, miraculously. And I, I don't know, I don't know enough about other sectors, but it's starting to become untrue in for a lot of places. But two wheelers, it was always untrue. And, and I realized this, over an almost nine, 10 month uh, period of just sort of noodling, like just sort of thinking about it. We hadn't started either. So this is the phase when we wanted to just give ourselves time, not actually start the company, take all the pressure, investors, blah, blah, blah. We're just hanging around. 2011, 2012. 13. 13. So 13 February, we left our jobs. And uh, before you registered, I think you registered in October, like October right? Yeah, yeah, 21st October. So February to October, we were just chilling around in the campus, building stuff and trying to make up our mind. What is it that we understand about the customer and what is it that we like to build, right? And basically figuring out that intersection. And I realized that, you know what? And I have bought enough scooters in, in my life. This, uh, by that point, I was already on my fourth scooter, fourth or fifth scooter, I forget. Uh, and my family always had enough scooters. And I was thinking about it. You know what? I don't recall a single instance of my family trying to buy the cheapest scooter in town. Because... The cheapest scooter was always TVS Scooty or Hero Pleasure. And those damn things don't sell even 10% of what Activa does. Yeah, right. You never see them. You never see them. Activa sells, back then also, it was selling, I think, almost two and a half million units per annum. And the cheaper scooters, almost 20, 30% cheaper, were selling like 200,000 units per annum. There's what, a huge difference. What percentile is the Activa in terms of pricing in that industry? Today, a typical Honda Activa on road will be about 90,000 rupees. Uh, you can buy something like a Scooty or a Hero Pleasure, I think at like 75, right? So there is a good delta, right? So if you're trying to go for the cheapest thing, a 20% delta is substantial enough for you to buy that. But people weren't buying it. To the point that as we started reading more about bikes, we realized in almost every category in India, in every two-wheeler category in India, the winner product is typically in the top quartile of its pricing. So it's generally the most expensive product in that segment. Almost never the market winning product is the cheapest in that segment. It is almost never. Um, it further got validated. I think it was 2018 or so. Obviously, by this point, we have made up our decisions, but it further got validated. 2017, uh, 2017 Bajaj started a price war with Hero. To, uh, for the commuter bikes segment, which is the largest two-wheeler segment in India. And I remember Bajaj cut prices by 20%. 20% for the lowest price band in the industry. I was expecting Bajaj to like absolutely win. Of course. Like, like, dominate. 
hero gained market share what one and a half years later hero gained market share and bajaj finally got tired and said you know what screw this i can't keep discounting and does not make sense i want to retreat i want to give up this segment completely what do you think that is though i'm guessing it there's also other factors at play right it's not just psycho- consumer Actually, psychology so so the funny thing is it's it's not like it's a challenger brand it's it's a freaking bajaj right like like we've got grown up with the brand it was the first really successful scooter brand Shut in the up, country yeah. they've got enormous distribution they've got fantastic brand recall value uh their household name arguably even more than hero in some sense but the thing is indian customers at least in two years were already i could see was basically voting i will buy what i consider as higher value and trustable it's not about hero it's that specific bike splendor that's being sold for 30 years now my dad bought it i bought it and i'm on to my like third or second or third splendor the damn thing just works it works brilliantly i'm going to ride this 3 hours every day for the next 5 years i don't want to take chances why will i why like like i'll spend 80000 rupees for this splendor why will i take chances to save 15000 rupees what is the damn new thing that bajaj is throwing at me breaks down breaks down just maybe once in a year it's a lot of headache yeah. i don't want that right what is the reco- what is the resale value is low like i know splendor works really well i know its resale value is fantastic i know the servicing is great i know it never breaks down why will i take a chance yeah i don't want to take a chance and it hit me that that's the opposite of what happened in china people are not voting to buy the cheapest thing people want an incredibly high amount of trust that's the reason maruti sells really well right not only because it's cheapest there have been cheaper attempts but because maruti has inspired this ridiculous amount of confidence that listen you cannot go wrong buying a maruti that's why tata is working today because tata again is playing on the trust element right okay you do not get many of these but but tata like the tata I'm, brand I'm following itself, along yeah tata is like the people yeah, love uh, that uh, brand yeah so i realize that people like people want brands that they can trust and they're willing to pay a reasonable premium for it um i don't think we should waste our time trying to build the cheapest thing and also uh, uh, i could see that people were starting to migrate up uh smartphones were already becoming a big thing and in many categories um uh, the earning potential was going up there was a statement by i think somebody at reliance just when we were starting up and i think it has had a massive lasting impact on me personally that india has been for decades misunderstood as a demand constrained market india has actually fundamentally been a supply constrained market and the person just said this and didn't really explain but the more i've understood the customer more i've understood the market more i've understood my own decisions i've realized it was true we've been we've had so little option of good quality products like sure we don't spend money on luxury goods but india will never spend money on luxury goods india's value for money does not mean cheapest it means the value element needs to be pretty high for the money spent and tr- and the trust factor is very important in trust that. is a big part of that value right yeah. like because because trust has like a lot of intangible element to it and and it's pretty huge uh so people will spend for better experiences but they will not splurge for luxury so if you just slap like an fancy italian name on your two wheeler i don't think people will spend a lot of money but if you build a better two wheeler like if you if you have maps on the handlebar like what we introduced and today the entire two wheeler market has people vote to buy that vehicle right it's not just ather that's building it ather ola hero tvs everybody literally every large two wheeler ev manufacturer today has maps on the handlebar which just blows your mind because you would not expect the indian two wheeler market to have innovated and be the market leader for displays and navigation on scooters you would expect european markets to do that you would expect maybe latin markets to do that japanese markets to do that but not india but i think that's the unrealized potential people will pay for use cases they but they want good value no i i really love that i think it's something like it's only something that i'm realizing in the last like 2 3 years that india is actually in terms of electric two wheelers like it is i would say the most impressive 
sort of out of any country in the world, the most yeah. impressive uh, market right now, right? And people talk about Indian innovation and we're so proud of UPI. And there's a couple of these developments, sure. but oftentimes electric two-wheelers are not cited just because it's like a very new space, right? It's only since the pandemic, I think that a lot of people have realized like, oh my gosh, Indian electric two-wheelers are the best in the world in their category. Absolutely. And I've made it my personal mission to sort of go out and tell the story because I think I think it changes something about how people think of what we can build. Um, the fact that in in hardware, there is a segment and it's a pretty large segment worldwide where we actually have not just the largest market, which we've always, Tuvila India has been the largest market for a while now, but we actually have the best technology. It It's quite mind blowing. Uh, there are very few hand. There, there are very few examples where India is the leading. Like fintech is big, obviously, but in my opinion, after fintech, very likely right now, the only market where India actually has the leading technology edge is electric two wheelers, and it's quite mind blowing. Uh, whether it's charging, it's protocols, uh, charging protocols, whether it's uh, batteries, it's software, it's uh, HMI, uh, or just sheer vehicle quality. At this point, uh, our, our market is actually the market leader. The thing that's disappointing for me, though, looking at how incredible this space is, and it's it's very like anyone outside of India might not even realize it because at the moment there really isn't a lot of export that's happening. Yeah. Although just, I think like even like a couple of hours ago, yeah. you tweeted out that we we're just like started. officially in Nepal, which is super exciting. Yeah, we literally just started sales. Like yeah. We just delivered the first quarter. Like as of today when yes. we're recording this? Yes. So cool. And you can't, and you won't go out onto the streets of Kathmandu and see Ola Electric S1s, or like I think pretty much any other Indian electric two wheeler. I think uh, TVS has been selling a few units there. Okay. Uh, but I think we've made probably the more noise at this point. Um, yeah, Ola's not there yet. And people are going to yeah. start seeing your scooters. Yeah, we're opening a bunch of showrooms. And it's so. sort of like it, it, it leaves an impact, I think, seeing Aether scooters for some reason. I think the, the way that you've designed the scooters to look very aesthetically pleasing, yeah. right? People start to, it's, it sparks conversations. And especially in a market like Kathmandu, where people have never like, they've never seen something like that before, right? They're going to be like, whoa, like, what is that thing? Where did you get it? And I think it's like, it oh yeah, you can actually go to the showroom down the street and pick it up. I think it makes people happy. Yeah. I think, uh, uh, we, we learned this early on. Uh, I think at its peak, uh, seven or eight out of 10 who test drove the scooter bought the scooter. So I had an OK at one point, bumps on seats. <laughs> like just, just 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 get people to test ride this man. Like don't do anything else. We can even stop doing marketing. I think we're wasting time. We should just get people on, on the seats. Okay, so you're in Nepal, which is uh, really exciting. Um and I have a little story here. So my brother, who's based in Canada, hmm. he just bought an electric scooter, which was really surprising to me because like Canadians aren't known for driving two wheelers around, yeah. except in summer, right? But during the winter it's like snowing, it's raining. Not a good time, not a good place to to drive a two-wheeler around. But he but he got one, and it's a Chinese brand, right? Yeah. Um, I think the biggest is uh, new, I think, internationally. Yeah, right. I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly. But I'm. it makes me sad because I'm like, well, I don't know about that particular model that he bought, but just generally across the board, I know that Indian electric scooters are the best in the world. They're super high quality. And yes, if you go into like the hyper premium segment of the Chinese EV two-wheeler market, you might find like, you know, comparable vehicles, but... I just wish that there he could the, that uh, an Indian electric scooter was an option for him, right, in Canada or any other country in the world apart from Nepal, right? That's oh, yeah. basically it. So, so it's sad. It's sad. That no, it's not. It's not sad. It's, I think uh, us in India building e wheelers still haven't fully understood this 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 opportunity, honestly, because what's kind of happened is China. I think strategically has decided to focus all its energy in building fantastic electric cars and trucks and buses. But they just sort of let go of the two-wheeler opportunity. They think it's not relevant and fair enough for them, other stuff is more relevant. So you've got a lot of commoditized OEMs and IU is also commoditized. Uh, and So they're investing in tech. They're investing in product. They're not investing in quality. At this point, they're just, they're just shipping. They just send their containers everywhere in the world. They've gotten a basic model built out of how to get stores, basic stores up and running in every country, Europe, Canada, North America, Latin America, everywhere. Uh, but they aren't selling a ton. It's not like NIU's exporting like a million electric two-wheelers or 10 million electric two-wheelers every year. They're exporting a very tiny fraction. Um, 
So China doesn't care about building good products here. Uh, and they're not exactly cheap also, also, by the way. And Japan hates electric for some weird, I don't know, cultural reason. I'm not sure. Actually, maybe not cultural. So Japan really, really does not want to build electric vehicles. Uh, whether it's Honda, it's Toyota, everybody, right? Suzuki. So... Is there anywhere else? Or is it just India and China, basically? Actually, it's done, right? Like, only there are three large... Uh, okay, technically, I think Germany is a is, is a big opportunity. But, like, come on. Like, Germany's not going to match the pricing now. Uh, so that's kind of not really the future. So you effectively have three big countries, China, Japan, and India, who could build electric two-wheelers, which are really export-worthy. China doesn't care. And Japan really dislikes electric. That actually only leaves us and because of the local dynamic given the really really hectic competition here and number of startups and the amount of talent we have we are now starting to spam out a lot of products we are starting to like really really push the envelope our costing is getting better every month so that's what's changing re rewiring is happening for me personally that if that's the case then god we are going to export how is that not going to happen and then i was in this um uh, some government meeting that happened a couple of weeks ago and um, uh, somebody from the auto industry just put this number I think it was McKinsey McKinsey put this number up for the auto industry uh, to to one of the ministers that uh, so basically I was making the case that exports will be an interesting opportunity and then McKinsey guys put up these numbers and I was surprised by the number because the number said well India is exporting something like 3 billion dollars 4 billion dollars worth of two wheelers every year the global opportunity is something like about $100 billion. And like, what? what? <laughs> like, what? Like, our total domestic market is probably $25 billion. I, yeah, go go outside. Like, that's the real opportunity then. So I think my mind's uh, changed a lot on this. I can't still say that we are really, really doing this in a big way because it's still fairly fresh. But I'm I'm a changed guy now. But in terms of return on investment, right? Yeah. Let's say you are you have two options, right? Go international, which some people would say, right? Diminishing returns, the further out you go, the more you expand, the harder it is for you to kind of, um, yeah, recoup that investment versus going deeper into India, right? Tier two, tier three, which of those is the more lucrative option? Probably India, right? Uh, for now, yes. Yeah. But not after four or 500 stores in India. Once you've hit like 500 stores in India, uh, which I think we'll we'll get in about a year, year and a half, um, you have diminishing returns. Like 500 stores to 5,000 stores, you may double your sales max. You're not gonna like 10 extra sales. So after I think four, 500 stores, um, you've gotten, I think a better return going to large international markets. Uh, so that's what we're excited about now. Yeah. Because I can now see that. Listen, like if in eighteen months we'll hit that, we'll hit that uh, point. Then, then let's quickly run a few experiments and figure out what kind of products work in different international markets for us. So we're ready to push operationally those areas in a big way. We may just discover a different pot of gold there. Hmm. Yeah. Something else I wanted to talk about in connection with China, yeah. um, and I'm not sure. Like I don't know if this is like sensitive or what, um, but Fame Two. Um, there was a sort of disruption, right, where suddenly I think the government sort of changed. I don't know. There was a there was a bit of a tweak to that sort of policy, and I think the the I might be wrong about this, but I think the reason was that they kind of realized that a lot of these companies are just bringing in scooters, and, but like in pieces, and then assembling them in India, yeah. and so it's not actually made in India, right? Like it's not like you guys. Uh, I'm not sure what percentage is like brought from China versus like manufactured from scratch in India. Obviously, like batteries, for example, like there's no lithium in the country, so you have to bring that from outside. And there's all these different chips, for example, right? Like there's no chips being made in India, so you can't, you know, make them in India. So there always has to be some reliance on Korea or China or Taiwan. Hmm. Um, but I think the realization was that, oh, like a lot of these companies like are just building like carbon copies of, not even copies, like it is the actual Chinese vehicle that they're just bringing in. Yeah, including the logo sometimes. It, exactly. <laughs> there was... <laughs> Uh, if there's you want to look at it, there's a company that just uh, painted over the logo. They didn't even change the logo. Look at uh, there's a Chinese company. I think it's Li Liu Yuan. Liu Yuan. Yeah. yeah, you got it. So, anyone watching, look, just look up that company, L I Y U A N, or something, and look at the logo, and you might find that it's similar to uh, a, a certain Indian company. So, um, 
so yeah, in a way, like while we're talking about this international expansion and bringing mm. Indian scooters to the rest of the world, like part of me is also like, yeah, but like a lot of those scooters are actually Chinese scooters, right? So uh, it's interesting. It's like B to B to C for these Chinese companies in a way. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, but that's kind of, I think, uh, out now. I think there was this entire, uh, I think the market changed radically. Yeah. So um, let me not point fingers on specific brands, but let me just put it this way, because almost all the Chinese scooters that were getting imported in one way or the other were essentially low-speed scooters. Sure, there could be a few low-speed scooters generally made in India, but if it is a high-speed scooter, that's like north of 60, 70 kilometers per hour real speed, it is almost completely made in India, generally. Oh, yeah. Uh, so the proportion of low-speed scooters, uh, like 40 kilometers per hour or so, uh, in the overall two-wheeler market, e-two-wheeler market in India was like 80% year and a half ago. Today, that number is like sub 20. So the market's fully flipped and practically everything that you see getting sold now are high-speed electric scooters made by legitimate, credible companies with large, giant R&Ds all in India. Right? Hmm. Uh, whether it's Aether, whether it's uh, all our competitors, like all uh, the top five, six players all are largely made in India scooters. So I don't think that's the thing for now to worry about. But yeah, like, until a year ago, that was a that was a credible problem. Sure. And when you guys started, that was an even bigger problem. Where I've heard you talk about how um, the market from like 2007 to 2011, 12, something like that, was just literally like garbage Chinese imports that couldn't even like go over a flyover without you know, and the batteries would deplete. I guess that was the original opportunity that you guys were looking at, right? Replacing In those certain batteries. scenarios, if the battery was low enough, it wouldn't go over this cable. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I actually have a video. I have a video of the scooter not going over a cable this big. Like the wheel was really tiny, 10 inch, I think. And it wouldn't go over this cable. Like the, the motors were like a joke. Crazy. Um, uh, the problems I had those. So I bought four of those electric scooters uh, and I rode them until I broke all four of them. How long did it take to break them? <laughs> not much. A couple months? A few months, four months, six months. Uh, in one scooter while riding, the seat collapsed and I went in the storage. <laughs> In another scooter, uh, and I was riding inside the IIT Madras campus, and I started noticing that some of the handle seems a little far than what it was early. I was like, maybe, you know, I just probably went back a little bit. I don't know. I'll come forward. I'll come forward. But then I started noticing, no, it feels like the handle is going lower. I was like, hmm. I stopped, and I noticed the weld, the, the, the place where the handle bar and the entire front fork was welded to the frame, it was cracking and oh it was my. collapsing onto itself. That's terrifying. I have never in my life heard of a two-wheeler made in India whose handlebar just broke off. Like just riding. It's not like I go, went crashed into something. Like just Chuma decided to like sort of, you know, leave. Like it's done, dude. I'm, I'm walking out on you. <laughs> so uh, uh, it's a really, really bad quality. I think uh, we've come a long way from from those two wheelers now. But that was that was the first wave, right, of EVs, electric two wheelers. It was a long damn time, man. Yeah. From 2007 till I would say 2018, 2020 also. Like freaking 13 years that crap existed and I think it colored a lot of people's image of EV. Exactly. Uh, I, I think a lot of people just started thinking, you know, you, you've got to buy EV because you've got to save the environment. Otherwise, it's a compromise in every possible way. Uh, and that's, that's just a missed opportunity. Sure. But I think the, the, the question that I wanted to ask you is like in that scenario where all of the EVs are are pretty bad, right? There's no good options for people. Hmm. Um, and the market kind of collapsed at one point where I think, uh, and you've said this number before, that there was like uh, one year where there was a sale of one lakh electric scooters in the country. And then that went down to like 15,000 and yeah. 80 brands down to like 15 brands. Yeah. Um, so there was this crash. And I think that was like literally around the time that you started the company. Yeah. Like if you had gone to your investors or, I mean, I don't think you had many, there was like one or yeah, two investors, investors, but like if you had gone to like smart people um, yeah. and said, hey, like, is this a good opportunity? Should I get into this space and start a company here? Um, and they're looking at like this collapsing market. Wouldn't they have said, like, did you get that feedback from people that, hey, like this might not actually be a smart thing to start up in with no experience, with not like not having a wealthy family that can sort of back you for multiple years uh, you know, like, cause it's hard, right? It, it, 2013 until 2018, that's like, you're literally an R and D for that long. Yeah. You're rushing out, collect, like raising funds from people. Like that was a hard journey. 
Um, did anyone tell you like, hey, maybe just do something a little bit easier? Like, the uh, consensus was that this was a that this was a terrible, terrible, terrible idea. Um, in fact, I would say that is still the consensus. That like, oh, yeah. how we're going about it is, is pretty crazy. So I remember uh, meeting this really, really, really smart supplier uh, who I actually respect a lot. Uh, and he gave me candid feedback. This is, um, I have to recall, I think 2020. Uh, yeah, 2020, I think. And he gave me this candid feedback that, Tarun, I don't know how you're doing it. but And by this point, we had like... I think it's 2019, yeah. We had like 300 people in engineering. Uh, we've grown from there, but 300 people in engineering. And this was by far the largest group put together anywhere in the world to build an electric two-wheeler before starting any substantial revenue, <laughs> okay? Like, I have no idea how you're doing this, but if I didn't know you, I would just tell you this is stupid, this is crazy, and all of us in the supply community think you are off, you're, you're completely off. Nobody puts in this much money to build a product before before actually profits in India, forget forget uh, revenue. Uh, nobody's done that in, in, in automotive. You guys were losing so much money. And not just so much money. This is the thing is, in India, nobody had put R&D first in the two-wheel industry. Uh, TVS had done a lot of a bit of work, but they grew into that over 40 years right? Um, they started with this entire partnership with Suzuki and so on and gradually built a testing capability and then they built a reputation. But I I even them, very few companies actually ever build their platforms themselves. And we had been a, we had taken a pretty massive effort on. We were like, hey, listen, uh, we're going to do this the right way. If we're building this, we're building a fantastic product. We're building the battery packs. We're building charging. We're building software. We're building everything from up and we're going to do this all in India. Um, you tell that so, to anyone smart, and they're gonna be like, "Dude, this is impossible!" Like, don't so even no, try. Not, not everybody who's smart. Uh, there, there were founders who who would sort of gone through their own battles in life. I think many of them liked what we were doing. For example, such an and Benzer, course, yeah. right? Your first they, they, they put the money million, where their yeah. mouth is. But yeah, a lot of people kept telling me for a long time. Back in twenty thirteen, hardware was also considered like a terrible idea. Uh, building a vehicle. It just never happened. Like there was not a single startup that had built an EV from scratch in India. The last example was Reva by a fairly credible entrepreneur, Chetan. And, and, and he built it with family money, right? Like hundreds of crores in it. Oh, yeah. We bought five lakhs to the table. <laughs> Between me and my co-founder, like eight lakhs. Okay, maybe. Yeah, eight lakhs. That's it. So we had no money. Uh, people looked outside to see if they're benchmarks. And they're like, listen, people are building EV companies in China and US, but they are experienced auto executives, right? Like that's somebody who's worked for 10 years at Tesla or 20 years at GM and is like getting all his buddies together and is starting this big thing where they're raising $200 million off the bat. Or it's like really experienced entrepreneurs in China. Like they're already building like mobile phones and extra that's the stuff. Thing. You guys, there's nothing exceptional about you. It's, yeah, nothing, but, not to insult you, yeah, but like is, you like, don't come from an amazing, like, you know, uh, really influential, wealthy family. Yeah. You don't have years of experience, right? You've worked at Ashok Leyland at this point, um, yeah. you know. And I think uh, Mercedes-Benz <laughs> is an intern. That's an intern. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, there's really, you're just two guys with a dream, which I think is just crazy. This is why I say, like, if you talk to any smart people, they would have said, uh, hey guys, like build a SaaS startup first, like, you know, start somewhere, uh, actually get become worse. a multimillionaire and then you can do this thing. Actually get worse because uh, both of us are mechanical engineers. We had never sold it to cables together and we wanted <laughs> to build an EV, right? Like I have no idea how to put a circuit together. I have never, I don't understand the difference between power electronics and embedded and we don't code. So we can't even write the software that we are pitching this company for. We're, we're, these are part of the reasons, but we were pretty hardworking. So these are part of the reasons why 2013, when we left our jobs, we didn't immediately start up. We kind of spent eight, nine months, 10 months, basically just just sitting around in ID, just like reading the heck out of this, getting to a point where we got a lot of conviction that, listen, we got this. I think we have now built enough. All those five years that we did not learn electronics, I think we've caught up on all of that now. I think we understand some of this, enough of this. I think we can now build this. But yeah, if you were to look at a resume, nothing was in exciting, uh, uh, like really telling you that these guys are going to 
hated um and and i think uh, if we were no, uh, actually all possible mistakes uh no good background no money uh we weren't hiring experience we were basically hiring our college friends uh, who all basically had the same sad story uh are doing hardware in india building an auto company of the word of, of of like right off the bat um and doing all of this in chennai Right. not bangalore <laughs> right not where all the cool startup kids are not where all the money is being raised like not where people are raising a billion dollars but in freaking chennai uh, and that to not like as part of like a startup community for the first year we were sitting quietly in this tiny corner in research park in iit madras where nobody's really raising money at this point right so we did everything against standard advice i think every possible rule was broken. Yeah. And yeah. you guys almost uh, I don't know if people realize this but like you almost died before you even got started. You raised 5 lakh I think from one of your professors I believe it was and then 45 lakh from the I IIT Madras uh, research department and one, one small one angel. And uh, what is it? Sri Sri Nisan. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Vision yeah. Vision. Yeah. Um who's a California based correct. Uh, founder. Correct. correct. Um and then you Man, you really did your research. Yeah, 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 of course. So so you start with this like sort of this is like 50 lakh in total. Um and I think that was what got you till like September of 2014. Yep. And then you're like, okay, well we're going to run out of money. So, and I don't I haven't heard you tell this story. You might have told it on a different podcast, but I'd love to hear how you like so you guys took on personal loans basically to keep the keep going until October/November of 2014. So I think it was um July um we had a little bit of money left and then because we had no money to buy laptops uh we used to ask everybody to bring their own laptops and work off that because there's no money to buy laptops were you you're using the computers in the the lab no like we, you didn't there's, have there's computer? nothing so everybody just bring your own personal laptops and work off that and unfortunately that meant uh somebody had like a pirated version of some software on it so those guys found us out and they blamed us that listen like since you're using this inside a company the company's liable pay us a bunch of damages i'm like dude like this absolute worst timing like i got one month of runway left and july they took that runway off they they, they took pay, the damn money off it. you have said obviously so we, we just paid that off uh, which is fair like but it's not fair because it's anyways this is what everyone does i mean <sighs> no i i i, I thing is it anyways doesn't matter um <laughs> pirate software on that close the account clean that stuff make sure everybody clean the pirate software off the laptops but now what we now out of money and you don't have software <laughs> <laughs> uh what we did now was pretty dangerous because uh, we had raised a bit of money by taking early pre orders about 7 8 lakh rupees i kind of rolled the dice and said okay if this doesn't work out uh we'll have to personally pay these friends and folks back but let us use this money for now so we use that 7 8 lakhs uh i think in retrospect a pretty dangerous decision so because these pre, are pre orders this is in 2014 yeah 4 years before anything happened yeah. anything happened yeah yeah this is for the s340 pre orders yes yes oh, wow. so so the, so while i said that build for us i also said that you want to go out test if somebody likes a pitch right you don't know basically idiotically built for yourselves like right? like that can be pretty crazy product so i had gone out and met like a lot of people and pitched them like showing them sketches of what we'll build and specs and because everybody wants to say yes like like they know you so they'll say yes so i was like why don't you put money down why right? like why don't you give me a check for 85000 rupees if you really like this wow. amazingly 20 people said yes this right? is like the real life version of kickstarter yes <laughs> yeah so you got 20 people to say actually yes we collected between 10000 to 80000 rupees depending on how generous they were feeling So use up that money also. I was like, listen, if this startup crashes after this, I have to go back and personally pay all those guys back. But let's just roll the dice. This so is all on a handshake, like, or are you you actually like adding these people to your cap table? No, no, no. Like that's what. Like this technically is dead. I have to give this give this money back, right? Like, there's no option. Uh, that took us to like maybe August, September. I don't remember. Then borrowed money off our parents, uh, uh, making pinky promises that we'll return this money back. That's the last money in, and we'll run out now in November. Uh, so at this point, how much have you raised? 
total across. You raised only 45 lakhs, as, as I told you. The rest is all technically debt, right? Got it. Because another like 5, 10 lakhs of debt. Okay. So there's this, uh, there, there are some of these angels that I've been talking to now, now for six months. And they invite me over to Bangalore to sort of, you know, discuss the deal. And I go meet them in Lavelle's, uh, Lavelle's Road here. Uh, and these are all HNIs. I think they're nice. How uh, did you get connected with them? You I just no idea. cold like, emailed them? I was or? like cold mailing a bunch of people at that point. Like yeah. whoever's, whoever seems to have money, I'll, I'll sit and, you know, pitch. Uh, and these guys are like, yeah, we called you to basically say, you know, one of the land deals we were in didn't go well. So pff, not going to do it. What the? Why they do you ask me to come down to from come? Chennai? <laughs> like, why do you ask me to come down from Chennai to say this? You could have just like called me up and said, sorry. You wasted, like, wasted okay, your time, your energy, and also... I mean, your morale was probably took a hit there too, right? Yeah, I think I was pretty hardy. <laughs> Anyways, so I'm I'm walking around Lavelle's Road at this point, and um, I'd already met Sachin Bansal, so I'd already pitched to him. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I hadn't pitched fundraise to him. I had asked him for advice, uh, and genuinely advice, right? Like, not like advice, not like what investors tell you now that ask for advice when you want money, because I generally do not know if founders could put money, right? So like, I generally ask for advice. Uh, since I'm in Bangalore and this. I've got my bus the next day, uh, I think that night. Like, there's a bunch of hours, what do I do? So I just cold mailed him again. They listen, like, I'm in Bangalore, would love to come give you an update. And he repl- responded. And this is like a couple of days before Big Billion Day. So pretty, I was like, I'll rush. I went and met him and, and he invested on the spot. Well, you, I think you had asked him for, was it like 30 lakh or something? Yeah, I asked him for 25 lakhs. Yeah. And yeah. and uh, and, and then I thought I was, I was really pushing my luck. Yeah, <laughs> you you must have felt like oh, I better not ask for more because like he might just walk out of this meeting or something, right? Yeah, it's like listen, like at this point we spent forty five lakhs over a year, right? So if somebody gives us twenty five lakhs, I'm like it's like it's crazy. Uh, obviously, like my plan was to raise six crores, but I was like, yeah, that, we'll see when that happens. Let let's just first find find, find twenty five lakhs because at this point I haven't heard of a single hardware startup that's raised any money. Right? It's not like, yeah, somebody's raised like $20 million. No, no money has been raised. And I'm going out telling that I want to raise a million dollars, six crores back then, uh, which itself for an angel round back in 2014 was going to be pretty large. Um, so I said 25 lakhs, and he he does this thing, which I think I'll forever remember. He makes his face and he says, I, I, then I can do it, but on one condition. Um, I said, yeah, I'm already super happy. I'm like, yeah, anything, he'll do anything. it. He said, yes. I'm like, yeah, he'll do it. <laughs> like, yeah, what's the condition? Uh, I I want to do the entire round. I have to just tell him, Sachin, you realize I don't have an investor. So sure, please take the round. Take, take the round, right? Like what's, what am I negotiating here? Uh, I think that was like a life-changing moment for us. Oh my gosh. Because yeah. if he hadn't said yes, then we would have shut down next month and we were shut down tragically. And super burnt out because we would have owed all these people, good people, their money. We'd have owed our parents some money. And it's not like there's a very comfortable, comfy job to go back to. Uh, so it, I think we'd have just sat down with no experience, nothing to show for it. Uh, that thing, I should almost call him a co-founder, frankly, because that thing really set the company on. Yeah. I I um I made this real a little while ago, earlier this year, where I was talking about how one of the reasons why a lot of Indian startups don't go global is that they're thinking very logically, they're thinking very rationally. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why a lot of people don't start up in the first place is because they're like, well, statistically, I'm very likely to fail. And I have my family, maybe like you took money from family, friends, your network, right? That's a very risky, scary thing to do, yeah. not advisable, not smart, not responsible. I mean, you are being yeah. very irresponsible. Absolutely. Um, and yet some of the biggest, best companies in the world started the same way that you guys did, where you took a big risk, you put it all on the table, right? Like all the chips, it's like, if, you know, uh, what's it, what do they say? Uh, go all big in. or go home, yeah. all in. Yeah, exactly. Um, and somehow this thing came together, right? Where you even went to Bangalore and, uh, sorry, Bengaluru, and you know, went to all these H and I's. They said no, but then at the last possible second, right? Such in Bunso, and I think he brought in uh, Binny as well, yep. right? Yep. They invest in this like one million dollar round. So I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of luck, right? But oh, then, absolutely. But then Anybody also, you, it's not luck. It's crazy. It's, it, it is. But uh, sure, I, I think at by that point, I had already pitched this to like 80, 85 investors. So there's a fair bit of perseverance, but 
if, frankly, if that last meeting with Sachin hadn't happened, if he hadn't responded to my mail that day, because he 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 totally couldn't have right. Like, he could have missed big, it. Yeah, big billion day. Like that's the first big billion day Flipkart's gonna have, right? Uh, like just a couple of days around the corner. Like. Heck, if I have like a big release happening, like I I miss my mails for a week, even now. And he responded. Like, uh, I, I don't know if he responded every damn shit back then or like I just got lucky. He was scrolling and he just noticed what happened. But uh, there is a fair bit of luck involved. Uh, but I think um, it's it's best if you don't overthink it. I think... Um, then you uh, won't even start. Yeah, you can't. Like, I, I, I think, and I'm sure there'll be some statistics to prove it. The more experienced you are in an industry, the less likely you will start a world-changing company in that industry. Because if, you, if you're really going to change something massively, it's not going to happen by doing what is understood and agreed upon by folks in the industry, right? So if I had legitimate, let's say if I had 15 years of experience as an engineer in the auto industry, I would know immediately that building an electric scooter like this is going to require hundreds and hundreds of engineers who don't even exist in this country at this damn point, right? And it's going to require us to sell a product at a price that nobody has even come close to ever, right? And it's going to be damn hard to get the quality right for years, years. And it's going to take us years to build the first damn shit which is going to break down instantly, how is this a good idea, right? Like such a brilliant logical argument to kill this immediately, right? Except that it'll miss this tiny spark, but guess what? Customers like it. You will miss that tiny spark amidst all these facts. So it's good to, in the early stages, not know a lot so that you don't overthink a lot. Sure. And take risks and just kind of just start. I think that's the bit. That's the best advice. Right? It, it, see, I, I also want to be honest. I think our opportunity cost was low when we started up. I think we had that, uh, if I can call it a luxury, right? Like we didn't have a great job. Like we weren't saving like tons of money. We weren't becoming rich off our jobs. So it was easy for us to start up in some sense. You don't yeah. have a family. You don't have Not kids. married yet. No kids. Young enough. Uh, and hence, I think if you want to start up, that's the best point. True, true. Um, so now I think is the time for hardware in India. I feel like somehow there's this shift that's happening and, and people are starting to think now about, you know, a lot of the opportunities in, in internet businesses, SaaS, apps, like <clears throat> that's old news, right? Um, FinTech, same thing. Like it's, there's still exciting things to be done there, but hardware right now, that is like, it's just the perfect opportunity because it's actually accessible, like Indian Founders can actually build successful hardware companies. Aether is a great example, but there are many other successful Indian hardware startups that have just now kind of in the last two, three, four years started to become like big and successful. Um, and so I think young people in this country can look up to people like you and and sort of, okay, what did he do, right? What were the, what was the, st the five step process? And obviously like there's always going to need to be uh, ingenuity and, and innovation and, and the serendipity, right? This luck factor that comes into play. Um, but if you had to kind of, and I'm putting you on the spot here, but like lay it out, like, you know, at f f a young person today, 2023 wants to start the next Aether, right? Maybe not the next Aether because then it's a competitor, but whatever, like something in hardware, right? Um, you know, how do you, how do you get the ball rolling and survive that first, uh, those first few years? I think uh, if you if you got a good uh, college background, it gives you a lot of air cover at the start. By the way, no point of not acknowledging that because you've got at the back of your mind uh, a good downside prediction. Absolute worst case, you've got confidence that you can get a job, right? In our case, we've been pretty screwed given the debts, but still a job, right? Like we wouldn't have been absolutely out. Uh, so I think it's you improve your odds by by by, by being in a in a more famous college. Uh, the advantage of being in a famous college though is that uh, you will likely find your founding team and likely your co-founder very, very easily. Uh, because a lot of people who are exactly thinking like you uh, have a fair bit of safety net already built in. And not, I'm not saying because of the families. None of us came from wealthy families. But because of your resume, your resume already is, 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 is a bit uh, better understood, right? Because of the college name. So that helps. But that aside, um, 
I think raising capital in the early stages is not really it, it's a, it's a it's a necessary condition but I don't think it's sufficient so if you're asking what determines success no not having capital determines failure but raising capital in the early stages has no bearing on whether you'll be successful or not none at all um what i think instead is uh, very important is to have a very 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 high conviction idea and a very deep insanely deep understanding of your customer i think that's surprisingly not that common uh, though it's one of the most given pieces of advice i think in most startups uh, out there but the number of times that founders don't understand why people will like what they're building uh it's quite insane so i think uh, knowing that uh is is possibly the best thing you can give yourselves because if you really understand your customer really well and if you really understand why they're going to like this and ideally you are the customer right like my belief you are the customer you understand why you like this and you've seen that validated because you've gone and met like a few hundred of these customers and you can see it in their eyes like the eyes light up when you say this right you want to see that uh, you absolutely want to see that that i would not want anybody to miss uh, a because it's so freaking good b if you will make a bunch of pivots when you go through that journey so i think uh, especially doing hardware i think we are now lucky for a few reasons that india has a very solid ecosystem of talent now which wasn't the case when we started but i think to some extent what eth has also built a talent like we now have 1000 people in rnd uh there is at least like a dozen hardware startups that have spawned out of eth i think the talent looks very very different now it's it's very rich uh be the indian consumer has really woken has really become comfortable with the idea of buying indian brands now right so if if you build a fitness thing you build a ring you build like a device you build like 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 some sort of a nice copro ish thingy you were to build an ev it's insane how many customers are now open to the idea of um, of of buying something from an indian brand i think d2c brands have also helped with that entire change of thought so consumers are ready uh, you got a good talent available investors are starting to understand how to make money in hardware startups that was not very well understood 10 years ago so the so so the missing pieces are you've got to understand the consumer and if you do that really well you will make an amazing pitch every single time you will make an amazing pitch to your employees you will make an amazing pitch to investors uh you will be great on social media everywhere right so i think uh my only suggestion would be do that like spend like if you got if you got to spend spend a year understanding it i wouldn't i i, I don't think people should really worry about wow how will you set up supply chain how will you set up manufacturing how will you set up distribution frankly all of that is you can find great talent now who has experience with all of that damn stuff who can fast track your journeys you will still have to understand it all as a founder but you can fast track all of it um but one thing you can't fast track is understanding the customer so just spend a bunch of time doing it. Yeah. And I think too um examples like Aether I think have given the public the sort of inspiration or belief that it actually can be done in India whereas maybe when you started uh you're going out you're pitching this idea and like people are kind of like, well, it's really a nice idea. But uh no, I think there are a lot of uh, nice ideas also. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are a lot of those also. I remember meeting this uh, really really famous investor in Ahmedabad. uh we we had terrible collateral back then this is 2013 or 2014 i think 2014 uh, so we would like literally uh, we wrote down ether energy in a, in a stylized font and we called that the logo and we had this uh, pictures of the scooter and i wrote like specs left and right of it and i would print it on a sheet fold it and make that like a i don't know, like a wedding card and give it to people like hey this is us uh so he saw that and and he just threw it away he's like I'll give you one good advice. Don't do it. Yeah. And he walked out. Oh wow. I mean what? Like like I flew to Ahmedabad like particularly to meet you. Like he had one word advice, like two words, no, no, three words. Don't do it. That's it. Uh so I got a lot of that. Huh? That was the meeting. That was the meeting. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That would have been soul crushing. I I know you said you're pretty hardy, but 
for me, if I walk into that meeting and he's like, just gives you that kind of response. I mean, and you've gone all that way, right? You took yeah. a bus or you flew? I don't remember. No, I would have flown, likely. Yeah. I've flown and then, it's just a lot of time spent, a lot of time spent, right? How do you, like, but I don't understand because how do you keep your personal conviction in moments like that where you, where it sometimes it just feels like it's good to be arrogant mm. <laughs> yeah it's it's <laughs> so i think the first 10 seconds i'm like deeply shaken i'm like dying inside and then you're like you're wrong it, because see you've walked in thinking really high of this person right like listen this person i'm gonna meet he's great he and i hope he really likes the idea and and i'm really craving his his blessing i'm really craving his uh uh, him to say that amazing guys, you're on the right track. I really want him to say this, right? Whatever you say, that's how you are wired. You will take hope for that. So the first 10 seconds when somebody says that, it's pretty soul crushing because you're like, I, I really respect you and you think I'm an idiot. How do I see the silver lining here? So only way out of that used to be generally immediately flip something and say, no, you are an idiot. I don't think you get it yet. Uh, and it's okay. It's fine. You you got a million things in your head. I don't think you can understand everything, but you don't get me. I'm I'm, I'm I have a better story. I'll just present it better next time. Exactly the way how you go down a pretty sad story also. So the the line is pretty bloody, honestly. Right? Like <laughs> so you you could like that kind of a mindset could take you down like like make you um not very open to feedback. Uh, honestly. True, right. If people keep telling you you're doing the wrong thing, which I've, I've, I don't know if you've been in this position, but I've been in the position not as an investor, but just as someone who's, you know, young people are approaching me and saying, hey, this is my startup idea. What do you think? And I'm like, I'm so sorry, but like, that's not going to work. You know, like, that's just not a good idea. Like you thought it was and it's cool. And it's, but like the total addressable market is probably tiny. Like it's a bunch of hobbyists. So if I got into a conversation, then I would want to take a lot of feedback. So for example, that case, there's nothing to take as feedback, right? Like all the guy told me is don't do it. Like what do I, what do I do with that feedback? So yeah. I've got to shut my system down to that feedback and just walk out because there's nothing more coming out. But uh, on the other hand, like there were a bunch of these alumni that I met who had actually the feedback that you were just saying. Like, they were also pretty sad for me. Like, they were like, this guy's been already, like, he's already wasted one and a half years trying to do this. Clearly, this is not going to work. They were like, they had this disappointed face. They don't want to tell you what, like, yeah, all but, the reasons they, why this is a but, bad but, idea. But they started telling me. But right? they want to help you. Yeah, they wanted to help me. So I think They, I got, they pity you. <laughs> <laughs> they did pity me. So I actually got decent advice from that corner. And I think you can, you can be intellectually honest about what they seem to be right on and what they're not. So for example, if somebody told me, yeah, the addressable market is pretty small. I could debate that out. That, that's because you think nobody will pay more for a two-wheeler, more for a scooter. But everything that I have seen, customers seem to be willing to pay more. They just, there's, literally there's not a scooter, single scooter priced more than one lakh rupees right now in the market. How can you decide that's because there is no market? Like if there are a bunch of products and they're all failing at it, then we'll draw some pattern out of it. There's nobody trying to even sell. On the other hand, there are lots of motorbikes priced more than, way more than a lakh. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. the same family goes and buys a motorbike from a Bajaj at 1.5 lakhs. But we all decide that, you know what, like if they've got to buy a scooter, that's it. At 80,000, 70,000, that's it. Like no money. I'm, right? I'm always surprised by where I see KTM motorcycles. Absolutely. KTM was my go-to example back then. Uh, so I could intellectually debate this out. Uh, and then decide. And so we did make pivots. It's not like we were pretty stubborn, uh, like 100% stubborn. We, dis we we realized early on that, listen, trying to build batteries for really bad electric vehicles is like a terrible business idea. And that much is obvious. But then we made this insane leap of saying, then let's just build a vehicle. <laughs> if, 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 if the vehicles are bad, we'll just build a vehicle and not stop at batteries. Uh, uh, we initially said, we'll swap these batteries out. Then we kept meeting customers. We kept meeting customers. I kept, I kept very closely observing how they would respond to everything I was telling them. And I noticed there's this very interesting thing that was happening that like if I would told them that, listen, your batteries are going to be swappable. You can just remove your batteries and like put a charge one in. They're like, they love it. Amazing. But if I told, like if I actually gave them a demo, so I left the battery on the floor, or sorry, on the, on the scooter and I asked them to take the battery out. I could see it. They didn't want to do it. Because the battery weighs a bunch, right? Oh. 
so we pivoted out of it i realized you know what we have a consumer problem here people don't want to lift batteries this is a dead end business um so we pivoted actually a few times uh but yeah to your original question how do you sort of survive really really brutal feedback sometimes you've just got to like let bounce off you yeah uh do you often do you angel invest by the way are you an investor in not no, uh, yeah i've i've uh, dabbled not dabble i don't dabble uh not angel investing but i have supported a few startups by close friends and ex ether members but i don't generally angel invest okay do you get a lot of people though coming to you and and being like hey like i i want advice on my hardware startup what do you think yeah 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 what are some cool ideas that you've been seeing people work on right now or even ideas that you've been i don't know if you even have the bandwidth to like think about anything apart from ether but right now and and i heard on a podcast you were like well people should go out and do asteroid mining. Yeah. Uh which Big is fan of it. which is certainly I mean that's uh way off in the future, but then again people no, would not. have said the same what, thing no. about I think asteroid mining is going to happen this decade. 100%. Oh, yeah? Almost almost certainly. Uh it's uh, generally both me and my co-founder both of love stuff that's long term. We 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 like longer term bets. Um so for example, like I've always believed now for a long while that we don't like literally as a as, like as a species we've stopped taking 100 year bets we don't we we just don't have the ability to think in terms of a 100 year project 200 year project but that used to happen it did yeah right like like people built all these people would start building a fortress die and then their their kid would take over and then their kid would take over yes yeah temples temples would be built over a period of 3 4 5 100 years cathedrals in europe right like built over 500 years like i'm like no we have no idea forget 500 years we can't even think in terms of 50 years so stuff that we can think long term about uh we like those so so generally as a direction uh i i i think the reason i've said i started mining in the past is because it's pretty obvious to me that as as our energy access expands so uh, many people don't know this the mission that we have set in the company is uh, reducing the cost of energy that's the stated mission for ether energy over its life it's not um, about selling electric scooters no it's not it's not about yeah no. but the electric electric scooters is part of it i i thought electric scooters was electric scooters was going to be like a 10 year project i think it's go, it's more like 20 25 years and that's fine that's okay 20 years we'll do electric scooters we will keep expanding into other stuff uh, at the right time and i have the luxury because i can think in terms of 50 years 70 years right now right so i have that luxury of saying it's fine we'll do 20 years this then we'll get into something else for me 20 years is not like life's turn i'm like think longer so anyways um so because of that i think as as energy becomes cheaper and our and our energy access improves eventually we'll run out of stuff to do in this planet it's almost inevitable that we'll be sending stuff out and i think asteroid mining is inevitable um so yeah have you done a lot of research into this like do you know for example i mean asteroid mining okay that's a big it's going to be a big industry at some point right and mm-hmm. someone's going to have to make the drill someone's going to or the laser or whatever it is that's doing the mining right someone's going to need to make the the propulsion system to get the thing into space right there's all these different sort of stakeholders in this industry um if you had to sort of break it down for mm-hmm. someone who's like a young person right now who's thinking okay you know Darren is telling me to get into asteroid mining where do i start what would be an opportunity in asteroid mining so i think one part of asteroid mining uh, will be figured out over the next 3 4 years which is what the work kind of that spacex and uh, uh all these other uh, uh space startups are doing which is just reusable rockets the taxi just, service just, just yeah. go as essentially the taxi service uh i think the work that will pop up is is going to be actually s- settling on the asteroid having some sort of a permanent ish base there and then running the supply chain back to earth and then the uh, the entire business of actually finding a business model of of uh, how do you sell this because the day asteroid mining starts the entire commodity market changes because prices will just sort of start behaving in a very different way so you need to understand that and you need to build a business that kind of best maximizes value there so i think there's a lot of opportunity uh but yeah i would say i think um settling on asteroids to do long term mining is going to be a pretty 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 big need 
people got to work on that uh and designing very very sp- a uh, custom equipment that will last at like minus 200 degrees uh for prolonged periods i think is going to be a pretty massive requirement uh and powering this entire enterprise up there with limited uh power limited solar power energy yeah, yeah. interesting i like the idea of of you know at some point in the next decade someone in bengaluru being like yeah i'm starting a an asteroid settlement startup you know that's my industry <laughs> yeah <laughs> we're going to build settlements Um okay uh, you mentioned energy there. Um what are some other opportunities in energy not necessarily EVs. Um yeah. I mean you guys are ether energy, right? Um and I don't know, I don't know how much you want to give away here cuz I'm not sure if you'd see those companies as competitors. No, um but in you you can't give your idea away right as the rightfully say. So it's very it's pretty damn difficult to convince people. Otherwise we'll all be raising money left right and center every time. Yeah. It's pretty hard to convince people when you're building the damn thing. So is giving away free ideas? No, it doesn't matter. So we really uh so the original thing that we started falling in love with was the idea of decentralized energy production, which is where the original idea of Sterling Engines came from. So the belief was that um we're going to move away from large centralized sources of energy production like coal power plants or, 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 or uh, thermal power plants in general to increasingly more decentralized sources so anyone you know, can make power i don't think it'll be that decentralized but think like like stations for maybe a block right or like 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 hsr may have like three four stations like those uh, and and they're going to be either geo or they're going to be solar powered uh, can't rule off nuclear but i think that's still a few years or decades out So we let started falling in love with the idea that eventually we're going to have decentralized energy production using essentially what will be free sources of energy or practically free sources of energy and we saw the opportunity in building that supply chain out that is and if you're going to have decentralized power generation you're going to you're going to need a very different power distribution infrastructure how do you get that power into houses because it's not coming off a common central national grid it's coming from like hsr grid right or like core mangla grid uh how will you store that how will you store it locally how will you store it in the houses in fact we 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 did believe for a long while and pro- probably still do that the power may not even be ac the power might be dc which means a complete rewiring of all equipment um so energy distribution energy storage uh and energy production we believe long for a long while is going to change completely it also obviously opens up that kind of a massive macro change opens up a million tiny opportunities the way you do, do metering the way you do load balancing the way you do sort of like everything changes completely um and i think that's all going to happen because we're going to move away from fossil fuel to increasingly more and more uh, renewable sources which are essentially free so yeah what are the inefficiencies right now in those three areas though i mean why is this not a reality today so step one is still happening um access to cheaper power is still kind of underway i don't think it needs any more technology i think it's now just a business of operations scaling up that operations will probably take another i guess 10 years but we'll get to a point where uh, i think the lowest cost of solar that i've heard is 1.2 rupees per unit 1.2 rupees i think we pay 7 rupees 8 rupees in bangalore Yeah, Bangalore, ten uh, rupees in Mumbai. So the lowest cost of solar has been one point two. Uh, wind is slightly expensive. So the f- fundamental cost of production has fallen a fair bit. Now what's going to happen is, uh, and it's already happening for the last few years, the cost of panels themselves is falling. Um, what we are missing right now is storage. Most renewable sources require. energy storage they require batteries basically like you got only a finite time in the day when when this energy is generated so you got to collect it all and you got to store it somewhere uh now that was not possible 10 years ago 10 years ago most storage solutions were crazy expensive lithium ion lithium ion batteries were pretty expensive lead acid was very inefficient sodium ion wasn't a thing uh cement storage wasn't a thing gravity storage wasn't a thing uh none of these are possible options the world has changed radically in the last 10 years so now you got storage solutions that are incredibly cheap so you got you got low cost of energy production you've got pretty low cost of storage you already have the infrastructure for supply built out energy production energy distribution energy storage 
I think they're all coming together at the right time. So if somebody were to start a company now, uh, use EVs. Use EVs as a starting point. Just go set up like maybe a a, a large charging uh, charging station for cars and scooters and everything put together. Power that entire thing out of solar. Uh, dig in massive sodium ion batteries in the basement uh, to store as much power as you can. Uh, use that stored power to charge EVs in 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 the night and the day if you got excess power start selling it to nearby commercials uh, at a very very low price and you've got a lot of things happening perfectly. Hmm. Um, it's a complicated new world but I do think it'll happen. There are opportunities here. There are going to be massive opportunities there. Energy is one of the most fundamental industries out there. The reason we refuse to remove the name energy out of our name is because. Uh, I think it still gives us a kick. Every time I talk about this, every time we dream about this, we like just the hope that we will make even this tiniest contribution. Like maybe the battery packs that we designed today might eventually turn out to be useful when somebody starts doing these large decentralized solutions tomorrow. Uh, if energy cost drops down by a factor of 10, and if we would have contributed even a tiny way in that, I think we are pretty, pretty, pretty happy. That was Tarun Neta, co-founder and CEO of Aether Energy. And just before we recorded this podcast, I went on Tarun's X page and I saw that he was complaining about Call of Duty Modern Warfare's massive download size. And so I had to ask him, are you a gamer? And here's what he said. I don't know if you play games, but you should try what I'm basically playing. The the Modern Warfare reboot, uh, pretty well done. Is it? Yeah, it's, it's pretty well done. It's Modern Warfare. So th there's a Modern Warfare series that they built in. Because uh, I, rem I remember playing the one where you could get, like, uh, you could build up these classes and, like, unlock these. Uh, and there was perks, right? So uh, the more kills you get, you can, like, call in a helicopter to shoot people or you can call in the dogs. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that I feel like that was, yeah. like, the golden era, which is when I played. That's all, That old stuff is still there. And But then it, like... I don't know. It just they just started to like rinse and repeat, right? It was just like yeah, there's autopilot. a lot of repeat. There's a lot of repeat. I think the the good stuff is they've got a good story this time, and uh, the graphics are damn good. Are you a, are you like a, would you say you're a gamer? No, I don't. I casual think, gamer? Yeah, casual gamer. Yes. You probably don't have a lot of time to, to play yeah, games. Yeah. So I used to play a lot of uh, Age of Empires. Mm. Um, that seemed to be popular in India back in like the the early 2000s. You know, Dipinder Goyal was also really into Age yeah? of Empires. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I was playing it all the way to like final year of college oh yeah uh, in fact I played it for a few years even after into the startup uh, only stopped when after I lost folks who could play it like nobody plays it now thank you so much for watching or listening to this episode of Millionaire Mondays and I'll catch you in the next one